more of the Kennedy Bachelors, plus the MTV Movie Awards, next DT. Everyone on our set knew that Bob was gay. I remember her kissing and licking my earlobe. The Brady Bunch, the stories you never knew, the home movies from the set of America's favorite TV family. In Tiger's Doghouse, a full makeout session. The sex, the scandal, the fights on the set. How bad did it get? Bad. We set the record straight about Cindy Brady's X-rated movie credit. I did participate in one porn film. Greg, high on the set, and the truth about his real-life date with his TV mom. I was going to put all my moves on her. I was kind of like a teacher to him. The original script, the recent reunion. We really are family. The reason I'm here. The tragedy of TV dad, Robert Reed. Can you imagine the turmoil that he must have been in and the conflict? I'm here at Encounters, a local gay hangout Robert used to frequent. Fights with the producers, his drinking during the day. Did you ever see him drunk on the set? His estranged daughter from a two-year marriage, then a diagnosis with HIV. If Bob should happen to cut himself, don't kiss his wound. Why Reed didn't have a will and the kids' regrets over not saying goodbye. I never told Bob how much he meant to me. Behind the rumor, behind the headline, behind the Bradys. This is Entertainment Tonight, the most watched entertainment news program in the world. Hi, everybody, and welcome to our Entertainment Tonight in-depth look at the Brady Bunch. I'm Bob Goen. And I'm Jan Carl. It's a little overgrown now. There's a fence in front. And back then, it seemed so much bigger. Yeah, it did. But this was 4222 Clinton Way, the house where the Brady family grew up in front of our eyes. Now, behind these walls were stories that the public never knew. There was marijuana. There was drinking, on-the-set sexual encounters, and secrets that one of the stars would carry to his grave. It's a theme song familiar to millions of TV viewers. The original script bears the title, The Brady Brood, but the show that became known as The Brady Bunch took four years to sell. Even though it never made it into the top ten during its five-year run, it has earned a place in television history thanks to the chemistry between its principal actors. It's an unconscious uh, thing that we have. I know I always care very much about Bob, and, and it's become uh, just an unconscious thing of being together for so many years. Yeah, it's true. We really are that way. Joined at the hip, kind of. <laughs> Yet behind the scenes, the squeaky clean image was marred. There were rumors of romance between the kids. Everybody's favorite dad, Robert Reed, was known to storm off the set. And for years, he kept secret his homosexuality. Close friend and actress, Anne Haney. Being gay was not only not accepted, it was shameful. So he didn't like that part of himself. I loved Robert very much. I, I had great compassion for him because of his alternate lifestyle, which he certainly couldn't talk about. But the one-time Shakespearean actor, seen here in home movies taken when Reed whisked the Brady kids off to London for a vacation, wasn't the first choice for the role of Mike Brady. Series creator Sherwood Schwartz. I wanted Gene Hackman to be Mr. Brady. ABC said, we need a name. Uh, and the name at that time was Robert Reed. Florence Henderson wasn't first in line for the role of Carol Brady either. Joyce Bullifant, best known as Murray's wife on the Mary Tyler Moore Show, originally had the role. But her comedic style was deemed unsuitable for the part, and Henderson took her place. Nevertheless, before Reed and Henderson were even signed, Schwartz auditioned over 400 hopefuls for the parts of the six siblings. He ended up actually casting two sets of kids, blonde boys, brunette girls, brunette boys, and blonde girls. And it wasn't until uh, Florence Henderson and Robert Reed were set that the final decisions were made. I'm pretty sure Jodie Foster was probably up for the role of Cindy, since we were always up for the same roles. And uh, Anessa Jones from Family Affair, who's no longer with us. According to Schwartz, Olsen made the cut in their first meeting. He was charmed by the little girl with the endearing lisp. She was so cute. But she came in and she told me about being on gun smoke and she was on a horse and it got scared by a rattlesnake. <laughs> With the family intact, there was one more spot to fill. Comedian Ann B. Davis became Alice the Housekeeper, 
although not without some coaxing of the show's producer, Paramount Pictures. We investigated and found that she was doing a uh, stand-up comedy act in Seattle. Paramount said she's unavailable. I said, everybody's available. What's the problem? Well, she has two more weeks to go on her engagement in Seattle. I said, how much does that cost? They told me, and I said, spend the money. Mike says, now look, boys, let's all eat a good breakfast today. I know you're bound to be excited. We have to have plenty of nourishment and energy, and that's why it's important to have a good breakfast. Premiering on September 26, 1969, The Brady Bunch opened with a wedding, setting up the blissful but harried life of a couple with a full house. But by the end, it was a house divided. Robert Reed was noticeably absent from the series finale, the result of one of his infamous disagreements with Sherwood Schwartz. He refused to do the script as it was written and was then promptly dismissed from the episode. But Schwartz says he returned to the set on the night of taping and wouldn't leave. I called Paramount. I told them the problem. And they said, well, that's no problem. They said, we'll have two security officers come and take him off the set. I said, over my dead body, I'm not going to see, have the kids see their father dragged off the set. That's, that's not on my set. They don't do that. Being Brady wasn't always a good thing for the cast. They had become famous on the show, but after the series was canceled, most of the stars found themselves typecast or unemployable. It was like having the rug pulled out from under you. If you've ever done acting, then if you're not doing acting anymore, then you're a failure. It was a frustration because there is a very strong Brady type. Being a part of a squeaky clean TV family proved to be a professional burden for its young stars. Most have dropped out of show business, those that remain have never achieved the lofty heights they knew as child performers. It's so amazing to me that I was a part of that. As Marsha Brady, Maureen McCormick was both idolized and envied by legions of girls. For boys, she was the girl next door dream come true. After fading from the limelight, the 43-year-old has recently been attempting a comeback. She starred in the short-lived 1997 series Teen Angel and has pursued a country music career. Maureen is married and has a 10-year-old daughter. Her put-upon TV sister Jan has turned 42. Eve Plum has given up acting and holds the distinction of being the first Brady kid to marry and divorce. Well, you sound a little disappointed. I thought you were going to be a telegram. <laughs> little Cindy Brady is all grown up, too. In fact, she's known at home as Mom. The 38-year-old has a three-year-old son, Michael. She has no regrets about her days as a Brady and resents the idea that somehow she's a failure for not being able to duplicate her childhood TV success. There are a lot of people that get out of acting by choice. I got out of acting by choice. That was also the decision made by Ann B. Davis. The Brady's faithful housekeeper, Alice, has left Hollywood behind, never married, and lives with a Christian minister and his wife in Texas. Dad, Robert Reed, continued to act until he died in 1992 of colon cancer, complicated by his HIV-positive status. Mama Brady's career continues to thrive. Today, Lawrence Henderson is a host on the new NBC Morning program later today. People always recognize me as Carol Brady. It's, uh, and I've gotten used to that. I accept it. I welcome it. Bobby Brady has dropped from the public eye, but Mike Lukenland still maintains ties to the entertainment industry. The married father of two lives in Utah, working behind the scenes on various local film and TV productions. Peter Brady still gets recognized by fans, though 42-year-old Christopher Knight left the spotlight long ago. The married computer industry specialist says he's happy with his life and his decision to give up acting. I had to give myself the freedom to say I don't like it, when the rest of the world thinks that it's the greatest thing in the world to do. Of all the kids, Barry Williams retains the firmest hold in the entertainment world. His 1992 book, Growing Up Brady, I Was a Teenage Greg, spent more than three months on the New York Times bestseller list. Barry has devoted his energies to musical theater and recently released this CD. Our show, for all it is and all its successes, doesn't generally engender a great deal of respect. Barry's book was turned into an NBC TV movie recently. At the premiere, the three Brady sons got together and Olsen met child actress Carly Schroeder, who played her in the movie. We really are family. The reason I'm here, because we're all kind of like the brothers and sisters. Coming up on Entertainment Tonight's Behind the Brady's. The dark side of Mr. Brady. 
why he hated his role as TV's favorite father. He could be a real pain in the butt. The real story behind why he kept his homosexuality secret, why he didn't want any Brady kids around as he died, and the daughter from his two-year marriage who didn't know he was gay. She had no real concept of, of HIV or any of that. Greg Brady's real-life date with his TV mom. I hoped every fantasy I'd ever had about her would come true. Barry Williams, Florence Henderson, their kiss, and what really happened when the two were alone. Is this really Cindy Brady? We have the real story behind her X-rated credit. That's coming up behind the Brady's on Entertainment Tonight. Welcome back to Entertainment Tonight. Behind the rumors, behind the headlines, behind the Brady's. This is stage five at Paramount Studios in Hollywood, where they shot the interiors and most of the scenes for the Brady Bunch. The bedrooms, the kitchen, those famous stairs, they've all been destroyed now. But the memories live on for the stars, including one of the boys who wasn't always a model son. You actually had to come do a scene after you had smoked pot. Barry Williams is 45 now, but at age 17, he was a bored teen sitting at home and curious about drugs. The story is that I was supposed to have a day off and uh, was experimenting, and I got, I got high, real high, and I was called in to work, and there wasn't much I could do about it. The entire house was built on one level, uh, and it took up the entire soundstage. Barry took me back to the exact spot of his youthful mistake, stage five. This was our driveway. The scene calls me, I'm fixing my bike yet again. <laughs> and, uh, and mom, uh, dad drives in and, and uh, I, I, I'm supposed to walk over to him. Well, I tripped over the bike, but I pretended that I didn't trip over the bike. Barry has reviewed his scene and calls it stupid. Now here it is. Does Greg look stoned to you? <laughs> Hi, Dad. And I'm starting to create with line readings, and I'm going to rewrite the scene. And Far out. Well, it doesn't look very seaworthy. Ah. As a matter of fact, it doesn't even look very bathtub-worthy. <laughs> I do remember him acting really weird that day. I, I remember it very well. Um, but I thought, well, let's, let's just bury. He's a teenager. He's weird. <laughs> I had no idea. I gave the, uh, the safest, most conservative performance I could muster and got the heck out of there and uh, I didn't repeat the uh, performance. Far out. Barry Williams says his whole Brady High left him feeling self-conscious and, quote, as fake as the turf in the Brady's backyard. Next on Entertainment Tonight, Behind the Brady's. Bobby Brady's arrest and the story behind the mugshot. Plus, the cast talks about the contract demands for more money that disrupted the show. Everyone should have asked for more money and everyone should have got more money. The body Brady kids. Which brother and sister were fooling around during this family trip to London? That's next on Entertainment Tonight, Behind the Brady's. To entertainment tonight, behind the rumors, behind the headlines, behind the Brady's. Back here at the Brady House, they may have seemed like the all-American family, but in real life, the Brady's had a dark side. Demands for more money on the set, a drunk driving arrest, and rumors that one of the Brady girls appeared in an X-rated film. And I did participate in one porn film called Love Probe from a Warm Planet. What? Little Cindy, Susan Olsen worked on an adult film? Susan Olsen? Pornography? No. Right now, this is the first I've heard about it. What did you think? Cool. Lest you get the wrong impression, Susan Olsen worked on one X-rated film, but not on camera. She provided some sound effects for which she was paid $50. Screen credit, though. The rumors about Susan actually stem from this movie. To the best of my knowledge, it comes from um, a tape that was circulated during the Gulf War called Crocodile Blondie, and um, supposedly the girl and it looks like me, and I, I, I know, <laughs> I've seen pictures of the girl, I'm very, very flattered. And so Susan finally sets the record straight on E.T. No, I'm not and never have been a porn queen. Little Bobby, Mike Lookinland, has had some post-Brady problems. He was arrested for drunk driving around two years ago in Utah. I saw him not too long after that incident, and 
he said it really was a blessing in disguise because it forced him to to look at behavior that was you know very self-destructive and he totally turned his life around i'm glad you understand mom oh i do i do he's a great guy um and uh i think uh i think it uh, scared him straight E.T. has actually run into Michael a few times over the years on the Utah set of Promised Land, where he worked as a camera assistant. He's fine. He's fine now. He has two kids. He's a lovely wife. And uh, uh, it was the only time that I ever heard of him having a problem. There actually were some problems with the Brady kids back when they starred on the show. For instance, Susan... It bothered my mom enough that, um, you know, she always felt tremendously guilty for the fact that I was working. And uh, particularly because uh, my father was guilty, he did not want me in the show. Then at one point, lawyers for the parents started to make money for the Brady kids. And they said, look, let's face it. First of all, the Brady Bunch is a major hit. Secondly, the reason it's a major hit are those six kids. They are very badly underpaid. I think probably everyone should have asked for more money and everyone should have got more money. Barry says his salary topped out at a modest $1,100 a week. His big payday didn't come until later. I like to point out the fact that uh, I was paid more money when we did A Very Brady Christmas than I made in all five years of doing the original show combined. Greg Brady's relationship with his TV mom was more than maternal. In his book, Barry Williams broke the news to the world that during production, he took Florence Henderson out on a date. Now the two talk to us about what really happened that Hollywood night. I had a crush on Florence Henderson almost the whole time that we filmed the show. He was such a cute kid. You know, big green eyes and his feet, he hadn't grown yet, and his feet were huge and his hands were huge, hands were huge. I wasn't completely naive uh, at the, even at that time. I mean, I recognized that she was at that time uh, a little more than twice my age, that she was already married, and she had four kids. But, heck, that wasn't my problem. Oh, yeah, so, just a few stumbling blocks. <laughs> some, I knew there was certain stumbling blocks. What did you hope would happen on this date with your TV mom? I hoped every fantasy I'd ever had about her would come true. I mean, I was going to put all my moves on her. I was 16. <laughs> It was just a very sweet, innocent evening. Like, give me a boat and a moonlit night, and I'm all set. The big date may have been over 25 years ago, but it was clearly a night to remember. It began with Barry picking up Florence at the hotel where she stayed during filming of the series. Her husband and kids were home in New York. Their destination was the Ambassador Hotel's Coconut Grove showroom. It's abandoned now, but frequently used by movie production crews. And she came to the door, and she looked all different than she did on the set. She's, now she was, in, um, she was in her Florence Henderson makeup instead of Carol Brady, which was uh, even more attractive. His brother had to drive him. He wasn't old enough to drive um, without a licensed driver. And he drove him to the hotel. Then I drove us on to, uh, to the Coconut Grove, to the Ambassador Hotel. And uh, when we walked in, he didn't know that you were supposed to tip the maitre d' uh, to get a good table. And so we were kind of way out in the boonie somewhere. And he said, why are we sitting here? And I said, well, you kind of have to give the maitre d' some money. So he goes back and he gives the maitre d' some money and we get moved to a better table. I think she, to her credit, was not patronizing to me. She did let me take charge of this evening. I was kind of like a teacher to him. Um, not like the one that, <laughs> that makes the news all the time that's in prison. I, uh, I did not have those kind of tendencies, thank God. Now, there is one disagreement between Barry and Florence. It's that goodnight kiss. He gave me a kiss on the cheek. And, uh, you know, it was just a very sweet, innocent evening. I gave her a hug and gave her a, a kiss. In my mind, this on was lips? on the lips, which in my mind was a romantic kiss. You were supposed to be in by 1130. Sorry I woke you up, Bobby. One thing is for sure, they never dated again because everyone on the set found out about it. It was just uh, the dreams of uh, uh, a boy whose hormones were starting to kick in, and Florence knew that as well as I did. The crew was starting to make fun of me, and then I realized that whenever Florence Henderson would get like within proximity of me, I was 
just breaking down into some really awkward postures and kind of giggling and being silly and, you know, and being stupid, being a teenager. And so they had surmised. And so I was embarrassed, frankly. And uh, as a result, I uh, turned my emotions into a more normal channel. Next, Behind the Brady's on Entertainment Tonight. Kissing in the doghouse, making out with Marsha. The stories from the stars of how the hormones were raging inside the Brady house. Was there kissing and, 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 and petting? Yes. Robert Reed, the gay life he tried to keep secret, and the daughter who didn't know about his homosexuality when she guest starred on the show. You're going to have to deal with, as a grown woman, that your father was gay. Robert Reed's close friend describes his lonely final days. That's coming up on Entertainment Tonight, Behind the Brady's. Our in-depth look at the real-life stories of the Brady Bunch. I'm Bob Goen. And I'm Jan Carl. Put six kids together in one house, lock them on a stage for mm, 12 hours a day, mix in some raging hormones, and what do you get? Well, a recipe for hanky-panky between the Brady brothers and sisters. Okay, gang, let's go. Come on, man. Come on, Cindy. Ladies, oh, no, it's my age. On screen, they were six siblings as wholesome as the day is long. But despite their family ties, when the director yelled cut, this six-pack of pubescent players really went into action. Susan Olsen and, and uh, Michael Lookinland, for a while, uh, paired up. Uh, they were the first, actually, to do that. It's hard to believe, but the littlest Brady's, Susan Olsen and Mike Lookinland, were the first to consummate their union. Well, sort of. We go into Tiger's doghouse, kind of, you know, to be alone, and you know, it was, it was this this game we were playing that that we were in love, and um, that we we got married on the set. We had a fake ceremony. Big sisters Jan and Marcia only added fuel to the fire. Even Maureen used to like throw me in the dressing room with him and lock the door. <laughs> and say, go at it. And um, we didn't know what to do. I, you know, nowadays, I guess when seven-year-olds say that they're making out, they're really making out. But uh, back then, we didn't really know what we were doing, so there was a lot of closed mouth kissing and hugging and going, I love you. But even as the youngest pair of TV siblings were getting to know one another in a whole different way, their older counterparts were also getting busy. What's going on here? Well, well, we can't oh, even make a movie. Eve Plum and Christopher Knight caved into their teenage desires one night as the cast was sailing for England aboard the QE2. To say it was a pleasure cruise would be an understatement. And then there's a knock on the door, and it's Eve coming to my room. I mean, this was set up on on all of their parts for Chris, you know. So um, I remember her um, kissing and licking my earlobe, and I liked it. And I was 14. I still didn't know what to do with it. But it was sort of like one of those bookmarks. Hmm, this is interesting. Chris admits that his and Peter's come very slowly. <laughs> Which leads us to Marsha and Greg. You want to scare the fish to death? Okay, so we goof. It's fair to say that any teenage actor who's gone out on a date with his TV mom would no doubt make a play for his TV sister. And Barry Williams would be the first to tell you that he did. Was there intimacy? Yes. Uh, was there kissing and, 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 and petting? Yes. Did it ever develop into the, a full-fledged 4th of July spectacular that I had kind of secretly hoped for since the first day I'd laid eyes on her? Uh, no. And Barry says there was no shortage of people around on the set whose number one job was to make sure things didn't go too far. We had directors and producers and we had crew and we had our parents and we had our school teachers and we had all these powers that you know you disappear for five or ten or twenty minutes on the set they put yeah <laughs> they come a knocking but leave it to the sensible sibling peter brady to put all the high-spirited hanky-panky into perspective and this kind of stuff can only be looked at fondly it's just it's just kids Bobby Brady was the youngest Brady. When the show started, he was eight years old. When it ended, he was 13. Now, as the Brady Bunch became established, one thing became more and more certain for the show's producers. Their TV dad was a problem. Robert Reed would argue with them and nitpick about the most mundane things, and the rest of the cast would end up in the middle. For millions of fans, he will forever be known as Mike Brady, the perfect surrogate sitcom father. 
But Robert Reed never wanted to be remembered for the Brady Bunch, and he secretly despised the role. He was a great actor, he was a wonderful human being, he was a very private man. And he could be a real pain in the butt. <laughs> A classically trained actor, Reed had studied at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts and considered situation comedy to be beneath him. He didn't even want to film the pilot for The Brady Bunch, but he did so to fulfill a contract with Paramount, the studio behind the show. When a star doesn't want to do something, you're going to have trouble. Sherwood Schwartz says Reed was a problem from the very beginning. The actor insisted that even the most comical plot lines should be logical and often refused to act if he didn't get his way. Bob Reed used to go through the script with the script in one hand and the Encyclopedia Britannica in the other hand. And if there was any difference, he'd walk off the set. Sherwood says he tried to hide those arguments from Reed's young co-stars, but that was nearly impossible. How bad did it get? Bad. The two of them really came at the approach to our show from different corners. He was absolutely stubborn and in his resolve to not laugh at anything that they did. In one infamous incident, Robert stormed off the set because he was asked to say that the Brady kitchen smelled like strawberry heaven. He insisted strawberries had no odor when cooked. So I said, well, Bob, can you say, hey, this looks like strawberry heaven? And he said, oh, I could do that. Well, that little interlude cost Paramount maybe $50,000. Yahoo. I would always say to him, Bob, we're not doing Shakespeare here. This is a sitcom. This show is light. It's to make people laugh. Reed's conflicts with Schwartz continued over the years. Rumor has it he even showed up on the set drunk to protest scripts. But the Bradys don't agree on that. Bob used to enjoy his cocktails. I was never aware of him having any problem. And he never, he never came on the set that I know of um, wasted. A couple of times, uh, he had a long lunch. Let's put it that way. Did you ever see him drunk on the set? <laughs> oh, sure. There were some isolated incidents with uh, Robert um, that affected the filming, and yeah, I think he was being rebellious. And it was that rebellious nature that kept Robert out of the sitcom's final show. In the episode, Greg's hair turns orange after he uses a hair tonic. Reed said that was impossible and demanded the script be changed. And he said, well, I'm not going to do the show unless you change that element in the show. But I don't think he, he did it out of meanness or a sense of superiority. I just think he cared, and that was his way of expressing it. Robert Reed once said in an interview, quote, I should have tried to get out of the show rather than inflict my views on the cast. Coming up on Entertainment Tonight's Behind the Brady's. Robert Reed's homosexuality and why he had to keep it a secret. That could have caused the end of our show. The rumors on the Brady set, how Mrs. Brady discovered he was gay, and what the kids felt about their TV dad's lifestyle. I learned that Bob was gay when I was nine. Then, Robert Reed's final days, his battle with HIV and the cancer that killed him. He called me and said he wasn't feeling well. That's next. Behind the Brady's on Entertainment Tonight. Welcome back to Entertainment Tonight. Behind the rumors, behind the headlines, behind the Brady's. Robert Reed lived about 20 minutes from this Brady home in the city of Pasadena, California. Now, this is a place best known for its conservative politics and its images of Americana because of the Rose Parade. But Robert did not fit that mold. TV's family man had a hidden side, his homosexuality. Our Mark Steinis has the story. Everyone on our set knew that Bob was gay. That could have caused the end of our show if something like that were to get out. In the years before the Brady Bunch, Robert Reed was tormented by his sexual orientation. Torn between his conservative Midwestern upbringing and his homosexuality, he chose to play the role of loving husband and father. In the 50s, he married and had a daughter. But the relationship ended in divorce in 1959, and Robert began to pursue relationships with men. I'm here at Encounters, a local gay hangout Robert used to frequent. Back then, it was called Incognito. And while Robert tried to keep his homosexuality a secret from Hollywood, he found it increasingly difficult, especially when he began working on the Brady set. He was America's father. 
Can you imagine the turmoil that he must have been in and the conflict? And he suffered a lot. Florence Henderson says she first sensed Robert was gay during the filming of the series pilot episode when he became nervous before shooting a romantic scene. All of a sudden, it hit me. And I said, I know what's wrong. I said, Bob is gay, and he's concerned about how he looks. That was my personal feeling about it. While it was never discussed publicly, even the Brady kids began to suspect the truth about their TV dad. Certainly in the last couple of years of our show, I was aware uh, that he was gay. I learned that Bob was gay when I was nine. The way Mom told me was, you know, he loves men rather than women. I didn't really know what sex was, so I didn't... I certainly couldn't imagine how two men would have sex together. Those who knew Robert was gay respected his desire to keep it a secret. When it came to homosexuality, the 70s were still a conservative time in Hollywood, and Robert feared the truth could damage his career. It was a great rationalization. He could say, it's for the show. I can never come out because of the show. So I don't think he ever had to confront that issue. Robert's longtime friend, actress Anne Haney, says even after the series went off the air, he still protected his wholesome image. We've been out there uh, quite a bit, haven't we, Bob? Certainly have. Yes. <laughs> we slept together for five years, you know. Well. On the Brady Bunch. It was in the years that followed the series that Anne and Robert became close friends. They often took trips together, but Anne knew not to question Robert about his romantic life. I realized very on that it was not a subject that we were going to discuss. And I would go have a drink with Bob, and I would go back to my room. Bob would go out, and I have no idea where he went. And it was never discussed what went on from the time I left him to the time I saw him the next day. As the Bradys reunited for a series of TV specials in the 80s and early 90s, Reed continued to live a double life until his world came crashing down around him. No one knows how he got it or who gave it to him, but Robert Reed contracted the HIV virus. And while he couldn't keep his sexual orientation private, he did manage to keep his deadly disease out of the headlines until one tragic day. Bob? Thanks, Mark. Now, around Thanksgiving of 1991, Robert Reed's doctor gave him a deadly diagnosis. A tumor had been detected. And combined with his HIV positive status, the man that millions loved as Mr. Brady was going to die. Coming up on Entertainment Tonight's Behind the Brady's. Robert Reed, the dark, lonely days at the end of his life. He was a brilliant, brilliant man and a loner. There was a big hole in Bob's heart. Why he didn't have a will, the secret name he used to get his medicine for HIV, the daughter who didn't know about his deadly disease, and the day Mr. Brady knew he was going to die. He said, Florence, I really thought I was going to beat this, but um, he said, I'm not. And he asked me to, to call all the kids. That's next on Entertainment Tonight, Behind the Brady's. But in his final days, Robert Reed drew back into a dark world of secrecy and depression. Robert shunned the Brady cast and most of his friends toward the end and let only a few into his hospital room. One was his daughter Karen from a two-year marriage. The other was a woman he had met later in life who suddenly found herself watching as Mr. Brady slowly died. And he called me and said he wasn't feeling well. And said that uh, uh, he had uh, been diagnosed with um, cancer and not to worry. Robert Reed was fighting two battles at the end of his life. He was stricken with colon cancer and he was also facing the deadly AIDS virus. And if Bob should happen to cut himself, don't kiss his wound. As his life was coming to an end, he insisted on only telephone contact with his TV family. He only allowed his close friend, Anne Haney, to remain by his side. She called his daughter, Karen, to join her when it looked like the actor had but days to live. His own broken family was the opposite of the warm home life he was living on the Brady Bunch. Karen was three months old when that divorce happened. She was adopted by her mother's second husband, and Bob let that happen, and he always regretted that. During his Brady years, Reed attempted to play father to Karen, who actually made a guest appearance in a slumber party episode. Yeah, let's play that. Karen came to the set uh, for one episode. I never saw Karen too often. She looked exactly like Bob, exactly. I often felt like there was a big hole in Bob's heart. 
you know, just the very fact that his daughter lived in another state, he didn't get to see her much, and I don't know by what maybe the mother had turned her against Bob. And I think a lot of the love that he gave us six kids on the show was really the love that he had for her. One of his uh, angst-creating uh, problems, I think, was the fact that he didn't have as close a relationship with her as he would have liked, at least in the years that I was close to him. Will you come with me, please? Not me. Shortly after Karen had done the slumber party episode, Bob was planning on having her stay the summer with him. He had done up a room for her just beautifully. And then something happened, I don't know what, but she didn't come out for that summer. And I knew that Bob was very sad. Reed's TV family never knew what had gone wrong in Robert's relationship with Karen, but Ann Haney says she brought about a reconciliation years later after Karen was married and had had a baby. They had been estranged for a long period of time, and I, once he had a grandson, she had a, a child, and I kept saying, Bob, come on, you know, you need, this is your grandson. So finally they had begun to get back together just a little bit, and then he got sick. Haney broke the news to Karen that her father was gay, and that the AIDS virus was complicating his cancer treatment. She had no real concept of, of HIV or any of that so it was a it, it was a very strained situation because this all after all is her father now you're gonna have to deal with as a grown woman that your father was gay Reed hid his HIV status from the world and even had Haney pick up his AZT medication for the virus under his given name of Reitz so that no one would find out he didn't want anybody to know he was having it. I mean, you can't say, you know, Robert Reed. I mean, if that goes into a pharmacy, it's going to go all over the newspapers. Chemotherapy had caused Reed to lose his hair. And Haney says it wreaked havoc with his immune system. But his spirit remained strong. He got very weak. And, of course, we had to do the wig. But he wasn't willing to give up. And I could tell from the way he was talking that it was much harder than he was letting anybody know. Reed handled his intense pain alone at his Pasadena home. And a visit to his physician confirmed the worst. Dr. Green came in and he said, it's not good. And Bob said, what have I got, six months to a year? And Dr. Green said, three months, maybe. His condition had worsened until Haney had to take him to Pasadena's Huntington Memorial Hospital. He knew when I was driving him there, he said, if I go into the hospital, I'll never leave. While in the hospital, Haney encouraged Reed to write a will, but he never did. He was not enormously realistic about that part of it. Shortly before he died, he called me and he asked, um, he said, Florence, I really thought I was going to beat this, but um, he said, I'm not. And he asked me to, to call all the kids. I talked to him two days before he passed away. And, um, and I told him I loved him. I never told Bob how much he meant to me. Um, so I wrote a letter that he held a very special place in, you know, in my growing up that I never told him before, so I got that out. Robert Reed died alone on May 12th, 1992. His death certificate lists the official cause as colon cancer aggravated by the AIDS virus. The Brady Bunch reunited later to say goodbye to their TV father at a memorial service Barry Williams organized. His remains are buried in Skokie, Illinois, next to members of his family. His gravestone is adorned with the theatrical masks of comedy and tragedy, bearing the inscription, Good Night, Sweet Prince. He was a very proud man, a very private man, and really died with a great deal of courage and dignity. In the year before his death, Robert taught Shakespearean acting classes at UCLA. He told friends that that's what he would be doing for the rest of his life. as Nick at Night reruns The Brady Bunch almost daily. Yeah, there is still such a fascination with this show, just like the subject of next weekend's entertainment tonight. The Real Designing Women. Take care. You always hear rumors, and I heard rumors that the network was going to fire me if I didn't lose weight, so I start, you know, panicking. bizarre stuff like I'm chasing Annie Potts around the stage trying to get a Snickers bar from her or something and you know she's locking herself in a room I would just get so down and so depressed and 
and figure that I should just, you know, quit the business if I'm just this fat cow. And, and Annie would, uh, you know, say, It doesn't make you any less sweet or any less funny or any less beautiful. It just, I just kind of started to shut down and uh, was not this fascinating persona you see before you today. I just, you know, kind of just shut down and wanted to disappear and, and not draw any attention. Please don't notice the fat girl over in the corner. This is my first feature, so I've just been like a four-year-old. I went to the table reading, it's like, there's no Gibson. Designing women had seven years, and that's a history. I call that a history. And I miss my companions on that show all the time. It was so well, well written, and we were so damn good. Entertainment Tonight, always there. Who are the Kennedy Bachelors, plus the MTV movie?